Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cash Up, a weekly show where we'll converse with amazing folks in DFIR. Today is no exception. Today, I'm joined by David Cowan, Managing Director, U.S. Cybersecurity Services at KPMG U.S., author of multiple books, including Hacking Exposed Computer Forensics and the Anti-Hacker Toolkit 3rd Edition. He's also the host of the Forensic Lunch, which if you aren't watching, you should be watching weekly on Fridays at noon central time, the Forensic Lunch Test Kitchen episodes, as well as authoring HECF blog or Hacking Exposed Computer Forensics blog, which has over 700 blog posts. He previously ran his own computer forensics consultancy, GC Partners, and also created tools there such as Triforce ANJP Parser. He's a SANS instructor. I've taken his class. He is an amazing instructor. If you have an opportunity to take a class with him, I highly recommend it. He's also a red team captain at the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. He's a recent patent recipient. Congrats, David. He's the creator of the unofficial DEF CON D for CTF for the last several years, and where he took it over ever since winning the first official DEF CON D for CTF in 2016. Multi-time winner of Forensic Forecast Awards, including Article of the Year for Triforce in 2013, Blog of the Year in 2014, 2015, and 2019, Show of the Year in 2019, Nom in 2016 for Investigator of the Year, nominated 2014 Book of the Year, Team of the Year nomination for GC Partners in 2019, which brings us to this year where David is nominated for three. Uh, one, he's nominated with his HECF blog for D for Blog of the Year. Forensic Lunch is nominated for Show of the Year. And KPMG Cyber Response is um, nominated for Team of the Year. I see that Kevin just dropped the uh, link for the forecast awards in the box if you want to vote for him. And on top of that all, he is the best person in the world to get a recommendation for a good taco. That's personal opinion. <laughs> so welcome, Dave. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but not traveling and staying home every day has been kind of amazing for me. <laughs> right? Likewise, it is very different, very unusual, and pretty darn awesome. So listed off a ton of incredible things you've done throughout your career and things you're continuing to do. How did you get here? Well, I think the biggest thing to remember is that everything looks impressive when you bunch it all up together. <laughs> so uh, I got started in forensics in 1999. Uh, so it's been, it'll be 21 years in December of my first real case. Uh, so I would definitely say, um, make sure you take things in context. Absolutely, <laughs> so. absolutely. So it took it took a lot of what a problem that Jessica knows very well, which is always saying yes, <laughs> figuring it out later and always saying yes. That's that's a good point, right? Like if you say yes and you challenge yourself and take it on, you're going to discover what you can do. But you also got to allow yourself the ability to fail in doing that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's that's a really, really important lesson there. So all those accomplishments, we don't talk about all the failures. <laughs> oh, no, there was a lot of failures. No, no, no. Absolutely. You're obviously well accomplished. Um, so what are you working on now? Ah, uh, so that's a good question. So right now I'm working on SANS 4509. I have to say that first or else they'll be very upset with me because I'm behind. <laughs> so I have to say <laughs> that I'm working on that first. So it's the uh, a cloud, enterprise cloud uh, DFIR class uh, with an emphasis on the actual cloud native services, less about how to do triage on a host. So it's something that's been a passion of mine, exploring kind of cloud, cloud forensics, uh, kind of understanding kind of the larger things that are possible and taking advantage of the new things that didn't exist before. You know, anything that's new, anything that you know opens up new possibilities or reopens previously closed doors, I'm fascinated by. So in addition to doing forensics and response with AWS and Azure and GPP, are you also then discussing how to utilize those environments to scale forensics? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, because there's, there's two sides of that, right? Absolutely correct. Yeah, so you could think of it uh, based upon the outline that I'm following is that three-fourths of the class is understanding the cloud environment, understanding the data sources, and then, you know, we're, we're building a whole bunch of log stash rules that you're going to see committed to Soft Elk to actually start ingesting all of that API data directly in for analysis. So you can start building those correlation points. Uh, but then the end of each day uh, for each of the major cloud environments is going to show how you actually automate and persist a cloud IR environment. Uh, so that way you can be, 
you know, at data scale and you can grow and, you know, depending upon, you know, which of the serverless frameworks you're talking about, but basically hooking in, detecting, responding, automating, or augmenting with your uh, on-premise stuff. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. That's awesome. Because awesome. <clears throat> awesome. I don't think people are really even thinking about the possibilities there. So that's really incredible that you're delving both into the artifacts and analysis of, but also the utilization. And it's incredible that you're covering both in one class. So even if you're not doing cloud acquisition and analysis of cloud environments yet, because if you're not doing them yet, you'll be doing them tomorrow. Absolutely. There's still value to taking the class to learn how you could be utilizing those environments to scale up and increase your time and utilization um, in forensics environments. So that's awesome. Yeah. What else yeah. is going on? You said that's first. <laughs> that's first. Absolutely first and foremost. Uh, second is we can, once the pandemic started, I realized that we should probably move the lunch to a weekly schedule. It was kind of two random weeks a month prior to that. The last time I did weekly is when I did a blog a day for a year challenge. Uh, and it was uh, a convenient excuse not to do a blog on Fridays. Uh, <laughs> I'll be <laughs> wait honest. Wait a second. Wait a second. I, I mean, that's really, really interesting because, to be honest, I can tell you that writing a one-page blog takes a lot more time than a 30-minute broadcast. <laughs> that's my experience as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, if, if, if I can do it – okay, here's a secret, right? So if I can do it live and not have to ever go back and re-edit and retouch – I can do it every day, no problem. Right. If I have to sit down and write it and look it up and figure out what's going wrong and, and make it good, it takes a whole lot longer. Well, I think that's one of the values um, with COVID-19 is I think people have become more comfortable with live streamed content. And I think that the acceptance of more raw content allows you there to be more content. I believe that's one of the reasons we're seeing so much. Um, if you look at this week in forensics, et cetera, right now, just so much. And I love the fact that that means that you're back to doing the lunch weekly because there's always such great projects to hear about that people are working on and you really share one or many every week. So anyone who's not looking, youtube.com uh, slash learn slash user slash learn forensics, you actually have the easiest YouTube <laughs> stream there is. And I know that Kevin dropped that in the chat. So, Well, I mean, I think the funny part there is just, how should I put this? Um, it's been easy to be a good show when there was no competition. Uh, but now that <laughs> now Jessica's there's a here, lot of shows. now that Jessica's here, you know, it was a good run. But <laughs> well, this show's a little bit different. Uh, you know, we're trying to get to understand the people behind Defer instead of just the Defer things, right? Like Forensic Lunch is really great for exposing and looking at the newest content. Yeah. Um, and that's, I can't think of anything better. I mean, it's fantastic. That's but yeah, there's definitely, partner. there's definitely a, a lot of uh, other shows out there now. It's great. Yeah, it no. is great. No. My favorite thing is when someone comes out of nowhere and has an amazing set of knowledge. And then all of a sudden you're like, where have you been? <laughs> Trust me, I've had a couple of people who've been blowing my mind recently with yeah. their stuff coming out and out nowhere. Uh, that is that is exactly why James Duffy will be on this show in, in, in September because... He's been blowing my mind with uh, some iOS stuff. Um, so what else are you working on? So uh, I'm trying to get back on track with the blog. Um, so I have a lot of uh, blog posts that are uh, blog post ideas. I can't even claim they're written, uh, queued up. So I need to get back to, to going back to the daily. Uh, I, I enjoy the daily blog. And I know that sounds weird, uh, but it forces me to keep researching. Yes. Uh, if not then it's too easy for me to put things off or to think I don't have something that I need or, you know, that I don't have enough time. If, if you force yourself to do it every day, you'll make it in smaller chunks. And what you'll find out is that most people, there's very, very few people who keep up with a daily schedule. Typically what they're doing mm -hmm. is just waiting for that topic of interest or for that series to finish so they can go back in and digest it at their pace. Right. I think you're 100% right. There's a lot of people who aren't taking all the content. But you know what? I'm a, I'm a big believer in just-in-time forensics. <laughs> that when you, when, you, when you put content out there, mm -hmm. that it's not the people who are keeping up with the content, who are reading everything that comes out or watching everything that comes out, who are finding the most use of it. It's when somebody has a topic mm -hmm. 
and they do a Google search and your content comes up while they're trying to figure out how that affects their case. And in that, uh, that's one of the key reasons we share, but somebody may be not having an issue with prefetch today, but tomorrow they see something and it's just not quite right. And they're like, has this changed? Has this, has there been a difference in this version, et cetera? Um, And then they're going to go back and, and find stuff. Um, Or if you're watching the content as it comes out, you'll remember and realize all the things that you screwed up on previous cases. I've totally had that experience watching uh, you do a test kitchen. So (laughs) going, Oh shoot! I probably shouldn't have stated that as <laughs> with as much authority as I did, because there are a couple of reasons that shell bag could have been there, and it was not the only artifact, of course. But there are some, it's what we it's, understood at the time. Right, so. it's what we understood at the time. But learning that is imperative, and and keeping your eyes open. So yeah, uh, I, I, I think that's the most valuable part of, of teaching forensics. Yes. Yes, because your students will ask you questions and challenge base assumptions that you've never considered. So when you just talked about how you write your daily blog in order to stay current, the, if it was not for my, I mean, my course, my job at Magnet, of course, I have to research and do things, but teaching at GMU um, with a synchronous class, um, I, and, and it being mobile forensics where I have to rewrite the entire course at, before every term um, for, for my class at Mason, where I am the author and can write it. Um, and have that flexibility to update like on the fly. It's it's an amazing amount of flexibility. I know with a SANS course, you might not have that flexibility to update a lesson on Sunday when you're delivering it on Monday. You really as should. Mo- no, you really right, that's right, because your idea. certification <laughs> test. I write I write the finals <laughs> and the exams in the lab, so I can write new labs and exams and questions as they come. But it really, really forces me to be current by by always updating the course. But then the second thing that it really forces me to do is that engagement with students. Students ask questions that you would have never thought of. Yeah. Their context is incredible. And you know, so many times, and I've seen you do this when you teach. I don't know, let's figure it out. Right. <laughs> and it's, it's fun and it's engaging and you get to learn new things. That's and, the big thing. And, and yeah, hopefully so. convince them to share what they just figured out. <laughs> um, so and to understand I, that this field is not complete. And it never will be. Like, like look at Maxim stuff, right? Mm-hmm. How long have we been doing NTFS forensics? And how much new crazy stuff does he come out with regularly? That, he is impressive. <laughs> right? Ex- extremely, extremely. Yes. Extremely. Okay, so you're keeping up the blog, you're doing, you're writing a SANS class, you're doing yep. weekly, um, a lot. by the way, you said it takes 20 years to amass, so just yeah. what you're doing right now is is, is quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's all small and, chunks, that's the thing, it's all small right, chunks. Right, right. The, the reason that other people aren't doing it is because they haven't learned not to care. And what I mean by that is that they care too much about what other people are thinking or what they may think of them. And I've screwed up enough times publicly that I don't care anymore. And so if I put something out that just doesn't work or I have to go back and fix, I'm okay with that because I've, I've understood that the point of contributing is not to wait for your peers to reach out to you and embrace you and say, what a wonderful person you are and how great the world is for what you've done. But it's for you. It's for you. You do it for yourself. And if you're not doing it for yourself, it's not going to be worth it. But also to share and build, right? Because Well, that's hopefully, right? That's hopefully. hopefully, (laughs) I know darn well if I put out something that it is never going to be complete. And it's always going to change, right? A new version is going to be released. There's going to be an update. A hardware configuration is going to change. But hopefully what you've shared gives somebody else a stepping stone for them to figure out the next thing. And then they share it back and... We all don't have to start from zero. That's the ideal scenario, right? But at a base case, (laughs) (laughs) the minimal viable product, the MVP. The MVP. I know a lot about MVP. (laughs) Is that you're producing something that you thought was interesting. And as long as it's relevant to you and it helped you understand something better, it's all that matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's really admirable that, um, that that you challenge yourself, that you put that goal on yourself to from time to time to put out a blog a day and it really forces it makes it easier right like the more you write the easier it is to write so what a lot of people don't realize is where all that came from so none of that started with me um it all started with Lenny Zeltzer yeah 
The Zeltzer Challenge. The Zeltzer Challenge. And so I was at my very first SANS author meeting for a class that I was supposed to write that never happened, but was going to be a great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hear it was going to be the best class ever. <laughs> it was It was going to be an amazing class, but it completely fell apart. Um, <laughs> but I was sitting in the room, and I, I had the blog, and I wrote the original blog to promote the, the second edition of Pack and Exposed, uh, Computer Forensic. Hence the name. And hence the name. Uh, and Le- and then the marketing person was like, oh, yeah, it's great when I have to do something for Lenny because he has, you know, 300 plus blogs because he did a blog a day. And so I always have content I can pull from anytime I need to, to work with him. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like you did that, Lenny? He's like, oh, yeah. He goes, to be honest, I miss it. And I was like, I'm going to do this. And the person who made sure that I kept doing it was my wife. Oh, really? She's like, did you blog today? And I'm like, oh, you're right. I need you to do that. She goes, go do that. You know what? That really goes to saying how much having a support network really helps, yes. even even if it's somebody who's not in forensics. Yeah. So that is just awesome and incredible. But I hear that you've got some other things coming up that you're working on. <laughs> I do. I do. So uh, every summer around the time the DEF CON happens, we try to host a unofficial DEF CON for DFI or CTF. Um, I love them. After- after the first one. And so you got to actually be involved in creating one. That was super fun. Yes, that was uh, super fun. Uh, and so this year, you know, we want to keep the tradition alive, even though DEF CON will be virtual this year. Um, we want to, you know, I have I have, have a whole month to make this happen. And we've done it <laughs> in far less time, to be completely honest. Dave, you're killing me. Do you know how much hours I spent on the last CTF? Oh, I know. I know, but again. I, I can't imagine doing one in less than six months at this oh. point. Jessica, come on. I'm a, I'm a novice. No, it's not that. You're a perfectionist. Oh, perfectionist. Fair, 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 fair. Because what no, I've discovered, I discovered, and I, I think you've that. now seen this too, is yeah. that all the work you put into making this amazing scenario and all these interesting facts, people utterly ignore and they go straight to the artifacts. Yes. If it's not the answer to the question, they don't care about the story. But man, the intricacies of the stories are so yes. much fun. Yeah, but, you know, and, and I know you know this now, but once you've done enough of them, you know, after a while you start developing a rhythm for it, you understand yeah. the things that are important, you start building your storyline, uh, and then you try to put it together. And so this year I have an interesting idea of what I'm trying to accomplish, uh, and I think it's going to work. Um, Matt and I have not talked about this, so Matt, if you see this, we're going to be talking uh, <laughs> relatively soon. He's on paternity leave right now, so I'm, you know, he's, he's getting to play with his, his son, uh, yeah. and then we'll, 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 we'll get it done. We always get it done. You know, it's it's really interesting that you speak to the what your goal is that it'll do, because I can definitely speak from experience that I have tried to leave artifacts of specific types of intrusion in um, a CTF, and then they weren't there. But then I usually learn that something changed. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> or, like, or the I how... didn't see this before, so yeah. I'm going to leave this, and I know how it got left there on the case I worked. And then you do that, and that thing isn't there. And yep. you're like, oh, now i got to research this change. And now I can't – now now I have to take the question out of CTF because I just blogged about it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> fun. No, but that's – It is fun. It is fun. It's, it's just like fun teaching, of... teaching a class teaches you one thing. Creating CTFs teaches you something different. Absolutely. I, I would say that there's so much that can be learned from a CTF, and I think it's great if more people um, do it. You, you do learn a lot from – you learn different things creating a CTF than competing in a CTF. I've competed in your CTFs as well. And they're very, very different lessons. They are very different exercises. Mm -hmm. And I will say one of the coolest things about post CTF is when you read people's blog posts about how they solve things that were not the way you intended for them to be solved. (laughs) You're like, Oh, cool. Um, I really, really, really hope that Kevin is going to play the DEF CON CTF. <laughs> I see him commenting that he'll actually play a DEF CON CTF. And I, I hope that David's response of yes there was to the live commentary, because yes. Kevin asked if there's going to be live commentary. Yes. And I have become a big fan of live commentary <laughs> for CTFs. Oh, my gosh. It is so enjoyable. I will say it's 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 a lot to be listening to live commentary while uh, running it on the other end. Kevin is ready to be roasted. He has volunteered. <laughs> so for those who don't know what Kevin's talking about, um, Magnet made 
the possibly regrettable decision to ask <laughs> us to do live commentary during the Magnet Summit CTF. And it was so enjoyable that I deleted the video. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I don't think we would let you have done it if it wasn't truly live. Uh, lots of questions about things that were... In a live event, there are so many things that are just live and it's less of an issue that they're as raw as they are because it's live. And sometimes you don't want those things to transpire to a recording, kind of like the way that I might give a slightly different version of a talk if it's not recorded than if oh, it's yeah. recorded. And um, 100% there were parts of MVS that were that we got a lot of feedback like, hey, why can't I access that chat again that existed with the speaker after the talk? Because those are limited time events so that the speaker is free to answer in a much more different manner than they might if they knew it was going to be in perpetuity. <laughs> so it's a, it's you a, know, it's, I think maybe that's what helped build my attitude of not caring anymore is that I live for so long and and I think others have lived with this as well, where everything you write and publish online can be used against you when yes. you testify. Uh, and I've had enough lawyers come up with just completely off the wall, out of context things. <laughs> you know, it's, it's to the point now where I just start laughing, right? It's right. Just, yeah, it's like, here it comes. Let's go. You know, the right. many before you have tried. <laughs> Right. And and at the end of the day, we all recognize that things change. Yeah. And if you're going to take a small blip at a context, right, we all have to, we can, we can demonstrate that. And yeah. that's all there is to it. Um, what about uh, D for Summit? You've got a talk coming up at D for Summit too. Yep. yep. Matt and I are going to be talking. Um, Matt came up with the theme and I, we couldn't come up with a better one. So we stuck with it. That's my official story. Uh, it's a Steve Urkel themed presentation called "Did I Do That?" Oh, I was hoping of... you were going to do a voice. <laughs> no. No. no, no, that's a bad idea because this is recorded. <laughs> yes, uh, but it's going to be all about how to do live testing and, and monitoring at, at a deeper inspection level to really help you understand kind of what's going on, you know, within the kernel and within the drivers. I think that's really important um, to really understand not just what an artifact is, but why it is and how it's there. And it really changes our understanding. All the things that we feel are good little nuggets that are left for us for investigatory purposes. No, they're to make things go faster. They're for optimization. Always. And, and, and understanding that also um, allows you to understand the instances when you don't have exactly. said artifact you expected. Exactly. So it's, it's important. I, I yeah. love the fact. I'm really looking forward to it. No, I, I like to think that a good, fully tested, different presentation where you understand the artifact ins and out is like a magic show. Yes. Because you're able to make things appear here and appear there and then disappear and reappear. And because you understand all the mechanisms of how things should and shouldn't work, to the audience it appears like magic, but you understand the fundamentals of what's really occurring. So really, it's testing and research. <laughs> it should be. That's the well, magic. And that's magic. Yeah. <laughs> that's magic. I mean, and, and to be honest, as practitioners, that is the magic we deliver to our customers, to the jury, to the investigator of what we're showing that comes out of digital data. So that's, Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So speaking of the magic that, that we all see, what's... What's kind of your go-to in terms of a resource? Twitter. Uh, Twitter. I go, on, I go on Twitter and I search for the hashtag DFIR and I look for things that I wasn't already tracking, things I wasn't seeing. I'm always looking for that new source of knowledge, that new viewpoint, that new thing. Because uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to stop, right? I always want Absolutely. to know. Absolutely. And I, I like, you know, This Week in Forensics is great. And you know, when it comes out, I skim through and I jump to the sections that are interesting to me. I mean, I'm not. I think everyone does that. I yeah, think that's yeah. why it's great that they're in sections. I agree. I agree. And sometimes, you know, Phil, I may disagree with the section I'm put in. <laughs> 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 I don't think I'm miscellaneous. Um, <laughs> I, I but... think we've all had those conversations. <laughs> no, I've never told that before. <laughs> oh, you haven't? Well, now he knows. <laughs> I keep most thoughts to myself. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or, in a, or in a podcast, one or the other. Yeah, you have Jessica asks. Um, <laughs> but really, I mean, yeah, I mean, 
keeping updated on Twitter is a big thing. Um, a lot I, of the yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say I think people underestimate Twitter because it's yes. not even sometimes. Um, people share things on hashtag DFIR that might not even be a finding that will be in Twitter. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's their question. Sometimes yeah. it's something they're running into, kind of like the stuff you see on Discord. But um, And obviously the Discord server is newer, but the, it also lets you know the problems people are seeing in areas that might need to be researched. Yeah. And you're seeing things in real time. And Sometimes I'm watching hashtag DFIR. I, I also follow it to see the areas um, that before Phil picks it up, because maybe it needs to be responded to or understood even more quickly. Sometimes by the time Sunday morning comes around, it's old news, um, or I already have to have been aware of it. So it's really important um, to, to keep an eye on it. And I would advise everyone who's tweeting to remember to put in the hashtag DFIR because a lot <laughs> of us do search by that hashtag. No, it's true. Um, it, it helps. It helps. It totally and, helps. And there's some you know, resources that are only on Twitter, like Ryan Benson's daily DFIR is a Twitter only post. It is a Twitter only post and it is immensely valuable. And it's like a little nugget, right? Like it's this just great nugget. I, I would say also, you know, I, I'm sure you do the same. Additional looking at hashtag DFIR, I have a list. I'm sure you also have a list, right? Um, so I have a list of forensicators I follow. I have a list of forensic femmes. And sometimes I look at other people's lists. So if there's somebody who I see who's doing really interesting things, not who follows them and who they're following, mm-hmm. but if they have a list, I'll be like, wow, this person's coming out with some really cool stuff What's their inspiration? What's their motivation? And sometimes that gets me to see things that are slightly outside of DFIR that might be more infosec that might be telling of things that we're going to need to be aware of in DFIR, informing each other. So, That's true. yeah, that's a good community. It's a great community, and hopefully it stays that way. Were you going to say another resource? Uh, let's see. Because after that, it really starts breaking up, right? Because there's different people that I... Who I read their stuff for different reasons, but I'll be honest that typically I know they put something new up because of Twitter. Like if yeah. if, I, if I see Maxim put up a post, I'm going to set aside part of my day to read it. There is no question. <laughs> and a Maxim post needs part of your day. It does. It does because <laughs> you know there's going to be some Ida Pro output, and if things oh, yeah. get good, um, if I see um, Oleg post, mm-hmm. set aside Absolutely. part of my day. Absolutely. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people like that, right? Where they've they're interested in certain aspects. You know, if Sarah posts, you know, oh, I'm going to take part of my day. Um, and there's other ones that kind of, you know, I, I have these open tabs on my browsers, um, especially on my phone. And they basically stay there until I have time to go back and read it. And it's something I'm interested in, but isn't probably going to have the direct impact that maybe kind of my, my primary authors do. Right, right, right. And because it might not be exactly in your scope of the niche area where most of your forensics land. Yeah. And it's it's interesting, right? Because we're a sub-discipline of InfoSec. But then within forensics, really, how many sub-disciplines are, are there? Really, though? That's a good question. I don't That's think That's a good we are. question. I think we're separate. That's my personal opinion. And I and I say that because there has been... Adjacent? Adjacent? Would that be adjacent. more correct? I adjacent? adjacent? I could see ad- adjacent. Because there's been forensics as long as there's been information security. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So adjacent might be yeah. might be a correct term. We're definitely a smaller segment. No question. Um, no if question. you were to compare yes. our community to their community. And our budgets to their budgets. Yes. And absolutely. our budgets to their <laughs> But, Absolutely. <laughs> but I think that's to our benefit, right? I think our smaller community, and especially like the tightness that kind of got built from the original small community of yes. law enforcement professionals, yes. uh, and, and the few of us in the private sector who kind of got let in the door, <laughs> you know, when no one was looking, uh, <laughs> I think I think kind of that strong bond helped build what this, this community, uh, because people had to rely on each other so much. And, you know, you have your occasional flare up of, of problems like any community does. Absolutely. But I don't think we've I personally would like to hope that we never got as toxic as some of the other communities have. Well, to be honest, I don't think we can be or we will be as toxic for a couple of reasons. And number one, we have to build on each other's work. Yeah, we We're do. not in a field where we can work in isolation. No one um, is really doing any except for, you know, the the, the first, you know, 
works that were done in the field, of course, they were in isolation. But for the majority of anything that's modern, it's being built upon other work and other people. And in that recognition, there's no way that we could act that way because we have to collaborate. There's so many changes. Um, That and when we, especially as forensics began, we had to be openly challenged on all of our opinions by other experts. I was going to say the other part is that we testify. Yeah. And we can testify against each other, right? And our work has to be prepared for court. So we can't be toxic. Like, those are the two reasons. One, because we have to build on each other. And two, intrinsically, the definition of forensics means that we, the work that we're doing has to be ready uh, to be testified to. And yeah. we have to be able to, and we, we have to be on both, be able to operate on both sides of that. Absolutely. So. And I, I think one of the funny things is that people have a misconception that you that it's bad if the person on the other side from you is incredibly good. It's the opposite. The better they are, the better the case, because then you spend so much less time arguing about meaningless things or yes. false theories, and you just get straight to the issue, and you work out the issue, and evidence wins. You know, at the end of the day, I, I, I would ponder if my view on this is actually what you would say controversial. But at the end of the day, evidence is evidence and it shouldn't there shouldn't even be the need for competing viewpoints on it Ah. because data is data like we should be elevated and have to strive for perfection in our analysis of only the smoking gun if you had perfection analysis of everything um you'd never finish a case but (laughs) my my overall feeling on that is that it's all about the truth and the evidence. So there aren't opposing parties or opposing sides. It should be a neutral analysis. Therefore, we are still at a point of immaturity that we do not have respect and certification and skill development to the point where we can feel we can bring in a neutral party to do the analysis that is not sided. But again, so I, I said my view is kind of controversial. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, I, I think once the... The science of digital science, and that's what's about. Gets, yes, gets to the point where we have established paths and cause and effect results that have no uh, other alternate explanations. Yes, then yes, but you know we're not our, there yet from a maturity we're not, standpoint. We're not, and our court system is adversarial by nature. Yes, you know, and I think that's probably a, one of the big differences between the U.S. courts and other courts is the adversarial nature of the parties. You know, and and some are much more civilized in their arguments. And, you know, for the most part, there are occasions where even in more foundational sciences that you will have an opposing expert and uh, an opposing and whichever side, an expert and the opposing expert. But in some disciplines, it is uncommon to have both testify. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So yeah. if you're talking blood spatter, for example, like DNA. you're DNA, fingerprint analysis, they are so scientifically driven, as is digital forensics, it is a science, but we just haven't reached that maturity, we haven't, we don't have that foundation. Our problem is there's so many factors that affect the test, and it's making sure that everybody agrees on the factors to be considered, and depending upon, you know, how you're being engaged is how much of that you get exposed to. So it's interesting because... Instead of potentially looking at the specific artifact and how do you know what that is, if we look at the methodology that was utilized, you can make those assertions on a more broad standpoint that are less. But I know we're completely leaving the realm of of your resources. Well, and then this is why, you know, I do the test kitchen is because I'm such a believer in recreation testing. If you can't recreate the artifacts that you see, you can't 100% understand them. So I would encourage anyone who's listening to, if you haven't checked out a forensics test kitchen, to check it out. And even if it's an artifact you're not interested in, because one of the most amazing things I grasp when I watch a test kitchen episode isn't necessarily the specificity of the artifact being examined, but it's the methodology of the testing and the questions that are raised. And actually what I love from, from about when David does this is if you happen to be watching it live, um, he'll ask, what should we check next? Where should we? And it becomes a conversation of engaged forensics. And I think that is just so powerful and so much fun. Right? Oh, I love it. I love it. But my favorite part about it is that it lets people escape 
all of their uh, evil corporate contracts to collaborate together. Yes, 100 <laughs> percent. Right. Because we don't necessarily. And I get excited about collaboration because it's yeah. when you have multiple people thinking together that you get the best yeah. ideas. So, yeah, it, no, I mean, when you get, you know, Joe and Vico and John Stewart and you and me and, and you know, whoever else is watching at that time and the absolutely. people who are completely new or are, are going to just throw something in. I mean, the, the breadth of experience at that point, you know, we can solve anything. Right. And it's it's just fun, right? Because the questions that come up and it's, oh, I didn't think about that. Let's try this, et cetera. It's just a blast. And then when we're all surprised. I love that. <laughs> and, and that has happened more yeah, than once. It has. So what's the most, uh, or what's an interesting experience you could share with us that you've had in the field? Oh, wow. Okay. So there's a lot. Um, yep. <laughs> so I finally, I mean, it's, it's over the past 21 years. I finally had my first person get referred for perjury. Oh. <laughs> it was uh, a defendant who uh, wrote multiple affidavits stating they didn't have something. Uh, and then finally, when the master showed up, he was like, oh, no, they totally had it. <laughs> uh, and I've always wondered, like, because I've had lots of people make uh, lots regrettable of people statements. Lie. Right. Uh, lots of people Regrettable lie. statements. <laughs> regrettable uh, things, statements, sure. <laughs> things that, in retrospect, they realized may not have been true, but they thought were true at the time. At and the this time, one, they felt yes. really convinced of it. Yes. And then when brought the evidence that was maybe found digitally, they realized that they must have misremembered. Yes. I've had many misremembrances. <laughs> misremembrances I've had as well. <laughs> many. But this is the first time that it was so clear that the judge said, I don't like to do this, but I have to refer this to perjury. Wow. Um, uh, and the thing that I'll never forget is how the lawyers had to write it, right? So here's the thing. Like, when you have to disclose something like this, you have to wonder. Like, because, you know, the lawyers on the other side, is, it's, they're professionals, and they're very good at their craft. And part of their craft is how they word and explain things. Um, and so they, they put out a statement to the judge that said, we regret to inform the court that our clients' past statements are no longer accurate. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that is very well worded. I was just like, I've always wondered what you would say. <laughs> that seems like the best thing you could say right now. That's great. We regret to inform the court that the past statements are <laughs> no longer accurate. and now long no longer accurate. <laughs> uh, um, I would say next to that, probably one of my most memorable trials and cases ever was. Uh, ILS v. Parse Space out of the District of Tennessee. Uh, it was a crazy case. All sorts of weird and crazy things happened. But it's one of my favorite kind of, you know, we're sitting around and, and catching uh, drink stories of when people ask me about, you know, what's your, you know, what are, you, what are the things you remember the most? I will never forget being asked a question on the stand in front of a jury. And this was a long time ago. This was like 2004. Okay. And, um, so one, my oldest brother is an attorney, and he's a trial lawyer. He's he's you know one of those guys you see on on the TV if you've been hurt in an accident. You know, <laughs> he is, and he's really good okay. at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's he, great. He, he sees himself as Robin Hood. You know, he's he he's helping people. Right. And so I called him before the trial, and I said, Michael, I've I've never been in front of a jury before. I've only testified in front of a judge. What do I need to know? And he goes, Well, what you need to do is every time they ask you a question, you turn and you face the jury. And you look at one of them in the eyes. And then you change who it is you look at each time so that uh -huh. they get to see you. Don't don't talk to the to the attorney because right. they don't matter. They're That's just asking you a question. Right. You need to speak to the jury. And so uh, it was a month-long trial. Uh, and we were in Memphis, Tennessee. And we worked really hard to kind of boil all the issues down to easily understandable PowerPoint slides. And there was all sorts of crazy technical issues we had to explain. And every time the lawyer would ask me a question, I would turn to face the jury and spend like three to five minutes just explaining wow. all the things I was considering and how this is the only thing left. Because I was making the assertion that was proven uh, that they had faked up the evidence that they used to support their wow. claims. Wow. And after a while, he's asking a question. I'm turning to the jury. They're nodding. They're nodding. He's asking me a question. I'm turning to the jury. They're nodding. They're giving him, you know, kind of nasty looks. And he's asking me a question. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse, right? You know, and they're nodding and nodding. And so finally, he's so frustrated. He's like, well, why would my client do this? And I'll never forget this moment. 
because there are certain moments, and there's other times, other cases where it's happened, where you have that brief glimmer of, is it time to be a smart ass? <laughs> <laughs> I love Dave. <laughs> and, and I can see that my lawyers are gripping the table. Like, literally, their hands are up holding the table, and they're looking at me like, what the hell is Dave about to say? And I looked at the lawyer, and I looked at the jury, and they're looking at me like, what are you going to say? And I knew how much they asked for in damages, and I said $16 million. That's why they would do this. And my lawyers, I, 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 I will tell you, this is true, stood up and made goalpost signs in the courtroom. <laughs> wow, my answer would have been that, 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 that you cannot ascertain why from digital evidence, but your answer was much more brilliant. <laughs> and, and, and that lawyer, realizing what he had done, because he realized that the second he opened his mouth and let the words out, and he, he realized it was too late to take him back. Because that the, what they teach you in law school is that you you never answer ask a question you know the answer to, but right. he was so frustrated with me by that point he let it out, <sighs> and he stood there silently for about three minutes. It felt like an eternity, but he had one last question and he was he was done. He didn't want to talk to me ever again. I'm sure not. <laughs> I'm sure if he ever sees your name come up on the opposing list, he's gonna walk away. <laughs> he didn't even try to object. <laughs> he was just done. He was just done with me. Wow. Okay, that's 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 a powerful <laughs> moment. And that's why I love this job. It's the best job ever. It, it is really the best is. job ever. I mean, it I've is. done a lot of weird and crazy stuff in my career, and there is nothing that tops what I get to do in forensics. <laughs> that's 100, 100. Mm -hmm. We get to do weird, crazy stuff. Yes. And sometimes we get to see the wacky results. Oh, yeah. And get to see those things unfold. Mm -hmm. So speaking of of uh, wacky things, and what's what's something that makes Dave tick outside of forensics? A hobby, activity? Uh, my kids. Oh, that's awesome. I spend a lot of time with my kids when I can. Uh, I like to you know, just try to show them how to be good people and kind of show them the world. We take lots of trips, uh, especially like if I'm going on a long uh, sand teach. You know, I try to take them with me, you know, the wife and kids, and we, we go around and kind of get to see different things. And, you know, I maybe I'm, you know, kind of boring in that way is, you know, my life is is forensics, uh, doing stuff with my kids. And then you're probably thinking about, you know, tacos and barbecue. I mean, that's. <laughs> I would say I would 100 percent believe that your children are well educated on good meat and good barbecue <laughs> and darn good tacos. <laughs> so. Sadly, you know, they're, they are young, so they have not fully embraced, their taste buds have not developed enough to handle some of the flavors. Uh, my, my daughter's getting there. She's definitely, she's now enjoying salsa. She's trying to, you know, understand things. My son is, is still adamantly refusing anything in that custody. <laughs> I also think it's great that you take advantage of the long worldwide global trips you sometimes do and, and bring your family along. Um, it's something I haven't had the courage to do in my travels, and I, I think it's awesome, and maybe I'll uh, do that once we return to travel, especially now that it's possible to educate your children with a computer online no, without a classroom, right? So I, I think, and I think that's something more of us may think about um, now that, who are parents, now that we've gone through this homeschooling advent, uh, that there might be opportunities when we have to travel for work and we get to go to these awesome places, that instead of me going someplace that I never got to see because all I saw was a conference room, a lab, and a hotel room, and an airport, that maybe my kids at least could get the opportunity to see that place and take some cool pictures. <laughs> Yeah, right, you know, like, it, absolutely. And the more they get to see of the world, the more they understand the world, the more they get to yes. see that people are the same. Right, and and you know, it goes back actually to exactly what you were saying that you're teaching them to be good people That's and the giving them those cultural experiences and those travel experiences and those interactions. That's awesome, and I love that. And I can't think of a better activity outside of forensics than finding time <laughs> for your family. So that is awesome. So. We actually have a question um, in the chat um, asking about is certification necessary for carrying out uh, forensics and producing evidence? So kind of your thoughts on certification. So I would. OK, so here's the thing. Right. So let's go back to the legal standard of an expert. Dubair. Mm -hmm. So you need oh, to be yes. an expert in one of three things. 
you need to be an expert by training. So certification would show that. By experience, you've been doing the job long enough to be able to show that you're capable and competent. Or by education, right? Mm -hmm. So it's training, experience, education. Or so, a combination thereof. Or a combination. If you can get all three, hey, more power to you. But that's the minimum qualification. So what I would say is if you don't have a friend's certification, but you have the education you have or the experience to be able to show, hey, I know what I'm doing, then maybe you don't need a certification right away. Is it a useful thing? I would say, and this is my personal belief, that of all of the you know, disciplines that are out there, we are probably the ones that benefit the most from a certification because what it does is allow us to show to other parties that we have a minimum level of competency in this thing. And so I'm seeing more and more attorneys now that are asking, do you have a certification in the product that you're using? Yeah, that's an interesting point, right? Because it's sometimes it's that's that's not about a certification showing that you are a knowledgeable forensicator under Daubert. That is about showing that you know how to utilize the tool that you use to get a result. And those are two very different very types of certifications. Different. Yes. Do you, um, can, do you know whether or not this is a successful result? Right. Do you, yep. do you know how to... It, it would be interesting if there was a certification that actually spoke to testing methodology. <laughs> right? Like, like that would be an interesting thing to, to, to get certified in. But I, I think you're 100% right. It depends where you are on the spectrum yeah. of, um, of your career, what you, what you have. And um, to be honest, um, it costs money to get training and certification. So if it you does. can get somebody else to pay for it, even better. <laughs> yeah, but I would definitely say, you know, forensics is one of those fields that you shouldn't just say, I'm going to run into this and YOLO it and give it a shot. That no. time has passed. When, no. when Jessica and I were starting, yeah. it's very <laughs> it different. was a much different it's time. very, very different. You can get in a lot of trouble for YOLOing forensics. Yes. And you could really hurt somebody, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, so it, it's something I get scared of um, when we when we talk about giving parsed results um, to people without an examiner playing a role in it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense from a process perspective to give parsed results to an investigator to look at, to say what's important, and then have the forensics examiner figure out what they mean? Yes. Does it scare me if a forensics examiner gets that cut out of that process? Absolutely. Yep. Because, because you have no context. And just because you have a URL, you know, I'll tell a quick story. I worked a case once where um, somebody had ran bulk extractor. The bulk extractor results were given directly uh, to an analyst. Mm -hmm. And an analyst went high and right that somebody in the organization's name came up on this bad guy's data. And what it turned out it was, and they were like running it up the flag. I said, well, wait, 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 wait. Do we know what that means? Yeah. And they're like, well, bulk extractor extracted it. And I'm like, but you don't know where that came from. They're like, but it's somebody in our organization. Yep. And I said, well, let me, can I take a look? And I looked at it and you know what it was? It was EXIF data on a picture that that person was researching the organization they thought were going to investigate them. So they were actually researching the people in the organization because they expected to get caught. And so the reason that that person's name and email address was in the data was because it was EXIF data on a personal picture they had taken when this person had researched the people they thought would be investigating them. So it almost, and I'm actually getting chills thinking about it, the it's so important to have training and education. And I never want to see automation cut out the expert. Yeah. Right? Like automation is great because tell me what's of interest, but please don't run with it. Yeah. Let me validate it. Let a forensics examiner validate it. Well, I mean, I think the I think the most simple one I have, and I think you know, we talked about this in class, is I had a lawyer one time, I handed them a forensic report and it said all the time during UTC. Well, they didn't understand what that meant. So they yeah. took the times and then they said, oh, this is at night. And they went and they pulled a month's worth of security tapes looking for evidence that this person was sneaking in and out of the building at night. And they thought it would be a great story to tell that this person was sneaking at night to steal data. And they wasted weeks of their lives watching these videotapes where they finally, they, they finally came back to me. And they said, Dave, everything's wrong. And I said, no, no, it's not. And they're like, no, no, everything's wrong. I have reviewed hours of security footage, and this person never arrived at these times. And I said, I understand that. 
did you subtract for the time zone offset? <laughs> and they said, what are you talking about? What's, what's the time zone offset? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, different things leave things in. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's really scary. And I, I can think of more than one instance where this has been a major issue where somebody innocent could have, or like you're talking about, hours spent looking at something yeah. um, unnecessarily because there was a misunderstanding of oh, parsed yeah. results because yeah. an expert wasn't there to say it for them. Uh, and, you know, especially when you're dealing with not my pants situations. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, I mean, even as forensic examiners, there's times where an uninformed party will accuse you. I mean, uh, I, yep. I was in open court in Boston one time and I was showing recovered webmail and they said, you know, Your Honor, we believe Mr. Cowan hacked my client's webmail. How else could he get this? <laughs> and I was like, Forensics. You recovered it from his disc. Forensics. You think I would come to? I didn't say this part out loud. Like, do you think I'd come to court with like hacked materials and like da da? <laughs> Here's evidence of a crime. No. Not well, so much. you know, um, but then it's even being able to understand when you do leave a footprint, mm -hmm. because there are times when um, I I work the case where the person in the fields. Um, face wound up in the evidence mm. on a mobile phone because there was an anti-forensics app that when a passcode was misentered took a picture with the front face and camera. Okay. We changed our procedures in that lab to anytime you were doing anything with a passcode, both the mic and the camera needed to be covered and everything needed to be silent. But yeah, it's, it's a problem when then uh, you have to explain, but we had, we knew exactly why. We explained why that person's face was in the, the gallery. Like, here's the most important thing, right? Is that when these things happen, even document. if you've made a mistake, you document it, document, you document, own document, it, document. you explain it, and the world will move on. It only gets bad if you try to hide it. It only gets bad if you try to hide it, 100%. I had a student tell me last week... Um, about an iPhone that was received and they said nobody touched it. And when they plugged in to celebrate, it said it had one attempt left mm. on the, the code. Obviously somebody tried, right? Like why wasn't that documented? Now we're in a different position, but if it were documented, it yeah. would have been fine. Been Don't different. just document it. Right. Yeah. So speaking of certifications, what advice would you give to somebody looking to get into forensics? Okay. So uh, this is, you know, obviously one of the questions we get asked a lot. A so, lot. A lot. <laughs> uh, and I want everyone to get into forensics, right? I think there's more need than we'll ever fill because there's more bad people than we'll ever deal with. Um, and so I would say it, it depends on where you are in your life. And let me explain. Um, if you are in a position where you're working for uh, a, a government organization, a military organization, or, or a large corporation that is willing to pay and transition you into the field, embrace that, run with that, and let all the funds they have available be used to your benefit. Get that those expensive certifications. Take that SANS class. It's not cheap, my friends. Not cheap. Uh, now, what I will tell you is that you know every once in a while there will be you know a contest for a free SANS class, and usually for our D for CTF, we'll have a free on-demand class. So there are ways to you know sh yeah. show your competency to do that. But if you're just getting started and you're not in that situation, right? You don't have a benefactor who is willing to pay that kind of, of upfront investment in capital. Because let's, let's be honest about what it is. You know, that is an investment into yourself. Absolutely. I have had some people who have uh, saved the resources to pay for that kind of training themselves. I'll be honest, that's a high risk. That is Absolutely. a high risk that you're investing that much. I mean, at that point, the traditional educational track may actually be a better value. I mean, when you consider, you know, my science class may cost as much as a semester of college or two. Or I was going to say, your, your, your science class costs yeah. two semesters at GMU. Yeah. Uh, or, <laughs> you know, in the case of my community college, you, know, you can get a whole associate. You can get a whole associate for the course. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Um, so I would say, you know, really evaluate, you know, what your options are around you. It's not just certification programs. You know, there are people who come to, especially for me, like if they come to my SANS class, they may have already had five to 10 years of training. Absolutely. I love those people because then I get to show them what they don't know. Right. We get to yeah. start from a foundation. Um, one of my favorite classes I ever taught, it was all new graduates from universities who had four years or more degrees in forensics. And so we got to skip the basics and just go nuts for a week. That's awesome. And I loved it. But here's the thing. 
having that upfront training experience means that when you take that really expensive class, which is worth it, don't get me wrong, just because it's expensive doesn't mean worth it. You no, get to it's their value is there. Fully in, you know, benefit from it rather than struggling to get that base information, right? To struggle through all of the data. So um, look at your local educational institutions. Um, educational, uh, you know, like George Mason, uh, yep. Champlain, uh, Champlain, Marshall. Excellent. Uh, my, our, our local community college system here uh, in, in Dallas has a great program. Um, I mean, there's tons of other ones. Purdue. I mean, Purdue, come on. It's, <laughs> it's interesting because there didn't used to be programs at all. And, and now there's a plethora of them for a plethora yes. of different styles. Um, I would encourage anybody who's curious, go look on DFIR.training. The university list has blown up. Oh, yeah. There are community college programs. There are associates that focus on forensics. There are undergraduate. There are master's programs. There is a wealth of different um, educational some of them are resources. Online only. You could some of them are night. online only. Yeah. And there's appellate grants for some of these where you can actually go to school for free. Right? I mean, there's government funds there. That even if you didn't, you know, like Jessica, serve your nation and get that GI Bill, uh, for others out there who are like me and just slackers, um, <laughs> there's free money that are available to you at appellate grants, especially for community colleges, where you can start getting these classes at no cost to you and start building that foundational skill. And then if you're saying, Dave, I don't have time for doing this through a university. I can't wait that long. I don't have the resources to take a class. What's left to me? I'll be honest, the thing that I would say that would ramp you up the fastest is take advantage of all of these free and open CTFs that are out there now yes. and start self-educating. Start running through the tools, reading through the solutions, and learning what things mean and how you can figure things out. But realize that in doing all of that self-testing, all you're doing is getting a base level set of knowledge, and now you need experience. Yeah. Now you need to actually do the real work on a daily basis. Use that to get your foot in the door to get that entry-level position. Whether it's Absolutely. in a SOC, within a law enforcement organization, within the military, whatever it is, get into that group because you'll never truly understand it until you do the work. I, I would say that's a really, really good point. So there are a lot of free resources. I would say also making sure if you are doing CTFs and things like that, share your solves, right? Share what you're finding because that'll give you something for your resume in forensics. But I think the most critical thing you said there is look at the organizations and if you can get into another department like a SOC or somewhere else in the LE, maybe even in civilian service, et cetera, that those are really good opportunities to get your foot in and transition. Um, James Duffy has a question. He said, would you valid a good personal portfolio or rather having certification more? Oh, personal portfolio. No question. 100%. I agree with, I, I complete agreements. 100%. Um, James, uh, if you're speaking for yourself in just the amount of work you've put out in the last 60 days, you're going to have no problem. <laughs> but, no, I mean, uh, for... That's the thing, right? I mean, if you think about some of the people, you know, like notice the things I didn't say, right? I didn't say you should read every blog out there. Right. That's because you don't have the context to really fully understand some of the stuff that's being talked about. I didn't say to watch the Friends at Lunch. I'm not right. going to claim that is an introductory new newcomer friendly it show. It isn't. I would it say that not. the Forensic Lunch is for people who understand forensics. It One is the, a very technical show. And you know, and, and I, my own company, I came and mentored in a lot of people new to the field and brought them in to help them understand. And one of the most interesting comments that I got from one of them uh, is he said, I track my progress in this field by how much I understand what's being discussed <laughs> on the forensic lunch. <laughs> I love that. I love that because they're able to measure growth and know yes. that they're learning and getting to comprehend more. And I think that's really important. Yeah, you can't use this week in forensics as a syllabus, nope. right? Uh, you would, the depth and the basics aren't necessarily what's being shared every week. Um, I would say D for Diva has put, Elon Wright has put together a really good list of sources for beginners. And she's a year into DFIR, but she transitioned from being in other InfoSec areas because this is where she wanted. She started in other um, InfoSec areas and, and she'll be a guest also later in August. Um, but it's, I think it's, I think you're you're spot on that the, you, it will only take you so far, all of the um, self-guided and testing. However, if you're sharing it and creating that personal portfolio, that demonstrates you really know how to do it. Wow. There are lots of certifications that do not actually have you physically touch evidence, right? right? More importantly, and the, 
it shows your passion and self-interest. Passion and self-interest. And when I interview you, I'm not going to ask you a gotcha question about some part of forensics you don't know. I'm going to ask you about your work. I'm going to ask you in-depth questions about how you came to your conclusions. And I know then that you know how to do forensics. I can teach you an artifact, the, the techniques and the methodology and the mindset and the passion. That's what, that's what you want to hire, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking of hiring, is your organization currently? Uh, we are. We are aggressively hiring. Uh, I would say that if, if you, and this is one of those things, right? If you're new to the field and you're looking to transition in, we would love to talk to you, but we need you to be able to be in, in a lab with people to be mentored and skilled up. So it's not the time for you to apply. Yes. We, once offices are reopened, now, that's the time we would love to have you and we'd love to show you what makes this field so great. But for those of you who have some experience and are able to work independently from home, uh, we would love to talk to you right now. And I think that you would be blown away to understand what is really possible uh, even in a in a big four, right? So I work for KPMG, as the the background clearly says behind me. <laughs> um, and, you know, always be on brand. Um, always on brand. <laughs> <laughs> you got your Sans polo and your KPMG <laughs> background. We note that you're representing both. Um, is it's it's different than what you think it is, and there is you know when I'm, if you know I I would evaluate a team that I would want to join by how long the team has been together how much maturity and time and reinvestment has occurred to solve all of the teething issues that you have when you start a lab. And this team has been together for probably 15 years. Wow. Um, and then on the other side, I would judge a university program in forensics by how much time they spend on Kerberos and, and encryption and how little they spend on artifacts. <laughs> you know, um, I, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, it sounds interesting, but I would evaluate a university depending on two different things. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in pure research, mm -hmm. um, I would look at the papers that they're publishing. I would look at what they've got at DFRWS. I would look at what's being per published in the Journal of Investigations from students and professors at that institution. Yeah, that's true. If you are looking for research, yeah. if you are looking for practicality, I would look at a university where the professors are mostly um, practitioners. So it, it depends on which way you want to go. There are universities that are very good at both. If you want to publish, don't go to GMU. Well, right? I, I teach there. And it's not a publishing university. It's a practical university. If you want to publish, there are a slew of great schools to go to. And I'm happy to give you recommendations. And I would literally be reading down the universities that are doing presentations at DFRWS and have articles published in the Journal of Investi uh, and, Digital Journal of Investigations. And for me, it's less about research and non-research. It's more right. about, are they reusing InfoSec classes in a forensic mm, track? <laughs> that is actually a very, 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 very valid point. Um, there are universities where it is really a cybersecurity program with a forensic subdiscipline. Yep. And it may look at the coursework and what it is. Also, yep. look at the backgrounds of the professors. If the yeah, professors absolutely. worked in digital forensics or have always or has published research or created tools, like who you'd be crazy not to want to learn from Yogesh Khatri, yep. right? Yep. Like, like absolutely crazy because he's got great tools and great research, mm -hmm. but you may not want to learn from someone who's never done forensics, doesn't produce content in the field, etc. So you research your schools that you're looking at to find one that fits your goals. Yeah. And, and there's a really big difference um, in what your goals are for what might be the right fit for you. There's such a variety. It's not like when, when I use my GI Bill to go get my master's, I didn't have many choices. Now there's a plethora of choices and you can really find the right thing. So that's that's a really good point that they're they're not all the same. But you don't need a university degree specifically yeah. in forensics. Absolutely not. Right? Like it's really it all good point. it all depends on where you are in your career and in your life. Absolutely. Are you career transitioning or are you beginning? I I can't emphasize how brilliant of a statement that is, that where you are depends on what path you need to get into this field. 
that your starting point really matters. Uh, just want to share a couple of comments before we go. Uh, Lori stating that if you understand the foundational aspects, it should not matter what the tool, uh, which is absolutely true. And she wants to add that uh, Brett says to make sure you document your personal study. 100%. Um, and Kevin says that choosing sometimes is the hardest part because there's lots of options. And that's really, really true. There's lots of ways to continue to progress. And and the other thing is don't stop learning. This isn't just about getting your job. Um, I have a job. I still take classes. I've taken SANS classes since, I, since I've even been in my current role, right? I'm not looking for something new. I'm just looking to continue to learn. And I still... I think it's important that even if you've been here a long time, uh, there's always new things to learn. And even if it's a topic you think you know, taking okay. that class, it changes. Taking a class allows you to see a different perspective, learn about things you haven't learned, and your exposure or even the reminders of maybe things you forgot, right, is incredible. So it's a never stopping thing. Wow. Well, thank you so much, David, for sharing all of your incredible insights and your journey and your advice and just awesome stories. <laughs> I'll never forget $16 million. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next week, we're going to have on Heather Smith uh, or at Lit Moose on, on Twitter. Uh, so that's going to be a real fun time, I'm sure, as well. Uh, and then coming up, we've got some great guests, Tara Melton, Alexis Brignoni, Joshua Hickman, Richie Cyrus, Cindy Murphy, Trey Amick, Elon Wright, James Duffy, Devin Ackerman, Ladrina Sharon. It's just, I, I feel like the luckiest person in the world to get to talk to some of my friends, mentors, idols, and people who are doing really cool stuff. So thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time. Bye.